Okay. Well, our culture and our society that we live in is not very, it's not really conducive to understanding salvation by God's grace through faith. We feel like we need to bring something, uh, be worth something, th worth something when we are asked to go to dinner, our first words out of our mouths is, what can we bring, right? And then we obsess over it. Uh, what to bring? Is it is it going to be okay? Is it going to be enough? Is it good enough, right? When really the hostess doesn't really care what we bring. She just wants you to come and have a good time, enjoy yourself, and enjoy the gift of a dinner and co good company, right? But we make it about us, <laughs> right? We do this. Right? We also live in a very materialistic society, very cost-driven society, right? And if something, nothing's really free, and if something's free, then it's no good, right? Because it must be cheap or unwanted. Um, the more expensive things are, the better quality they are, and, um, and the better craftsmanship. So free in our thinking means junk. Um, and we also live in a, a self-help society where, um, you know, we are very self-reliant, and, um, you know, <laughs> I have a prearranged soccer carpool. And when people drive my kid, I, I always feel like I, like I owe them something. Like, it's a meaning of a, a carpool. <laughs> Crazy. So we carry, but we carry this thinking into our relationship with God. We feel like we need to bring something to our salvation. We feel like uh, it can't be free or it's no good. Um, and we need to make it more worthy. We need to make ourselves more worthy. We may need to make God glad that he chose us, right? We feel like we should rely on ourselves uh, for our salvation. Um, and, um, and we have, we carry this independent spirit into our salvation. And we want a hand on our salvation when God is saying hands off. Paul stops us in our tracks, right? Because he's, he told us in the last chapter that salvation is a free gift from God. It is all God's grace. It's God's doing. It's God's choosing. He made atonement for us. He paid that death penalty for us so we wouldn't have to pay it. And, and, and really, there's not really anything in and of me that inherently makes me worthy of God choosing me. We aren't worthy to be chosen, but God in his love and his grace, he declares us not guilty. He imparts God's, the very righteousness of Jesus upon us, right? And he adopts us into his family. My eternal home is safe and secured by the very power of God. Now, I wanna throw out a couple disclaimers here. Um, I'm not saying that we throw works out uh, because if you read, Ephesians 2, like read it in context, verses 8 through 10. You have to read verses 10 also. Um, salvation, yes, it is God's grace. It's all about God. It is God's doing. It is not by works, right? But once we're saved, works will follow. That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, right? Why are we saved? To do good works that God prearranged for us before we were even born, right? Um, and then, um, you know, in, and, and unfortunately, um, if people claim to have faith and they say the sinner's prayer, they receive God's grace and God's forgiveness, and then they go on living like nothing happened, they go on in their sin, um, that's what Bonhoeffer uh, termed as cheap grace. And unfortunately, in our churches today, there's an awful lot of cheap grace and it's reflected in how people live their lives. So, um, so we receive God's free gift of grace through Jesus' death on the cross as payment for our sins. We receive God's righteousness. We will not go on sinning. Paul is going to address that uh, in the weeks ahead. So stay tuned for that. But God does not. Uh, uh, God does not. Uh, declare God, God does not justify us without regenerating us. So he talks about how when we are in Christ, we are new creations, right? We will desire to have to be made like Jesus. We will desire uh, to know God's will. We will desire to do God's will. We will have the Holy Spirit's uh, power within us 
uh, to be able to uh, be obedient. And that transformation takes time, right? As we grow in our faith. That's why growth is very important. So that's one disclaimer. Um, so we don't throw good works out. Um, but also, um, but it's not necessary. It's not uh, 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 involved in being saved. Okay. And the two, Jeff and I, we love the American uh, self-reliant, hard work, uh, independent spirit, uh, probably would uh, would have been, probably would have become homesteaders uh, had poor Joel not been born with his uh, severe cerebral palsy uh, almost 21 years ago. Um, and so we, 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 we are very self-reliant by nature and we love hard work. In fact, we thrive on hard work. Uh, so, so I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to knock that, uh, but uh, I do knock it when we bring it into our salvation. So that being said, Paul's saying, and he's told us that salvation is a free gift of God, that we can't, you know, do anything to add to our salvation. Uh, we can't make us ourselves more saved or more savable or, uh, or more secure in our salvation, right? Salvation is a work of God. It is Christ on the cross uh, by his grace through faith. Um, so then Paul, so we, we talked about that last week. So Paul, we get to chapter four in Romans and Paul uh, goes on and says, look, I'm going to give you two examples in scripture to prove what I'm saying to you. So uh, uh, chapter four, verse one to three. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered this matter? In fact, Abraham, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So I hope you're able to do the homework and you kind of reviewed uh, the life of Abraham uh, and, and, and we're able to see uh, this verse that Paul quotes. I hope you're able to read it in context. So that was from Genesis 15. So when, when um, you'll remember from our study in Genesis many years ago, uh, that, uh, and it's coming up, <laughs> one of these years we'll be doing Genesis real soon. Um, but you'll, you'll, you remember that um, when Abraham, when God called Abraham, it didn't, scripture doesn't really indicate that Abraham was actually looking for God or seeing God or even knew God. Um, it's, he was very wealthy. He had a lot of servants. Um, he had a lot of um, possessions, a lot of flocks and herds. And, um, and, and he seemed to have a really good life. He seemed to be very well off when God called him. And God made promises to him. This is from Genesis 12. Uh, he was older when God called him. He was 75. He was about 75, I think. Um, God told Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to bless people that bless you. And I'm going to curse people who curse you. And all the peoples of the earth are going to be blessed through you. Your offspring will be as numerous as the stars. God made this promise. And I think Abraham was probably like, okay, this is going to really have to be God's doing because at this point he was probably married to Sarah for probably 50 or more years, probably more than 50 years, 60 something years. Right. And, um, and, and he had no kids. So this promise was going to have to be all God. And, um, and, and, and like, um, like us, you know, we know God's promises get impatient and we kind of complain to God and 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 we, we we keep reading through Genesis and we get to Genesis 15 so this is many years later or some certain amount of time later um, Abraham's kind of like you know God I know you made these promises to me and uh and I, I have no no son it just hasn't happened yet and unfortunately all my inheritance is going to go to my servant and I'm very sad about this and God, don't worry, Abraham, got this. You're going to have a son, just trust me. And that's when scripture says, Abraham believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. So, you know, Abraham, so he had faith. He trusted in God's promise and God credited Abraham's account. He was declared righteous. His account was paid in full. 
And that's what Paul's saying is that Abraham was saved through faith, uh, not because of Abraham's works. Um, we come to verses uh, four to five. And I think what he's saying here, um, and I wanted to run this by Jeff, I wasn't able to, but I think what he's saying here is that basically, um, you know, salvation cannot possibly be from works because um, when we work, it means that we are to get paid as an obligation. And God is not obligated to anyone. God owes no one. And sometimes we think like, you know, if God owes us, like, you know, that, well, when we think that God owes us, we are on dangerous ground. And sometimes I think I even do, I catch myself even doing this, you know, subconsciously, like, you know, I'll be like, oh, God, I'm so faithful to you. I'm so, I do this and I do this and I'm, I, I've been, I've been serving you in this area. And then how can this happen? Or how can these people that are not faithful, you know, be attacking us or, or, you know, or whatever it is, or, or why is this not happening? I know this is your will. You know, I've been faithful to you. You know, I kind of hold it over God. And, and that's when like the Holy Spirit is like, whoa, <laughs> stop that, wrong thinking. Um, so I get uh, rebuked from the Holy Spirit and that's when I have to be like, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. That is my wrong thinking. You know, please help me, you know, have your mind and to, uh, to not think that way again because that is not honoring to you and not worthy of you. Um, so I think, I think that's what he's saying. So, and then Paul says, I'm going to give you another example. Let's look at David. And you'll remember last year, we spent several weeks talking about the life of David. You'll remember that as a young boy, um, David was called, he was anointed by God to be Israel's king. And, and he wasn't man's choice, right? Remember, remember, um, God said to Samuel, it's going to be through the sons of Jesse. So call him up. And Samuel's like, mm, nope, he's not here. <laughs> he says to Jesse, are you sure all your sons are here? And, and Jesse's like, oh yeah, uh, what's his name? Go get what's his name. <laughs> he couldn't even call my name. <laughs> oh, poor David, so insignificant, probably so tiny, so young, so insignificant, right? In the, in the eyes of man, right? Because even Samuel thought, you know, when he saw David's older brothers, well, you know, they were big and they were handsome and they were uh, warriors and, and very kingly in their appearances, right? And God had to correct uh, Samuel and God had to say, look, Samuel, man looks at outward appearances. Man judges on outward appearances, but God looks at the heart. So we know David uh, was a man, God called him a man after his own heart. Like God, uh, uh, David spent years cultivating his relationship with God. Um, and a as a shepherd and is uh, taking care of his father's flock, he, um, you know, he spent time with God. Uh, God used that time to prepare him to shepherd God's people, to be God's king. Uh, over God's people and uh, to be the king over God's people. And, um, and so he, he, he learned uh, to listen to God. He wrote these beautiful, many of our psalms come from him, psalms, psalms of praise. Um, so he learned to trust God and obey God. And even, even uh, so much so uh, that he even put his own life in danger. So uh, you'll remember when uh, Saul was hunting David down, uh, he wanted to kill David. Uh, David already knew what God's will was. God's will was that he would become king, and um, and 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 Saul was trying to kill him because of that, <laughs> and basically, and um, and there were uh, once or one or two times where uh, God brought. So David was on the run, and Saul was hunting him like an animal. And David's own men, a couple different times, David came across uh, Saul uh, and, and, and God and David's men said, look, look, uh, David, uh, God is delivering Saul into your hands. Kill him now. Take the throne. And David was like, whoa. Now, David knew that was God's will that he would be on the throne, but he was so obedient to the Lord that he wanted to take the throne God's way. God's means in God's timing, um, and he would not, even though it would have been self-defense, he still didn't take Saul's, um, take that opportunity to kill Saul. 
He waited, he was patient, he waited, trusted in the Lord. And yet even this amazing, faithful, God-honoring man um, uh, fell. So we saw that. You know, he became king and, and he, he got a little lazy and complacent. He fell. He let his lust life take control. And uh, he fell. He, he committed adultery. He then committed murder to cover his adultery. Right? David blew it. And yet he knew he, knew he needed to turn to the Lord. He did that. He trusted the Lord's promises. He received forgiveness from the Lord. We see that. Psalm 51. Read Psalm 51, please, in the entirety. It's beautiful. Uh, he wrote that psalm during this time, we, we assume, right? And it's a psalm of confession. It's a psalm of repentance, a beautiful heart. And, and you see him relying on uh, God's forgiveness on God cleansing him of his sin and God purifying him um, and, and, and uh, trusting in God's righteousness to make him right before God. Um, and then in here, um, in Romans, Paul um, quotes, oh, I think it's Psalm 30. I meant to look it up. I think it's Psalm 32. Uh, but that's a great psalm. Read the whole psalm. Please go back and read it. Um, you'll see the notes in your Bible which psalm it is. I'm pretty sure it's Psalm 32. Um, but read the whole psalm because he, he says in it, look, when I, when I didn't confess my sin, when I tried to hide my sin from you, God, you know, I just, I wasted away. I groaned. I just couldn't take it anymore. But when I came to you and I confessed my sin and I experienced your forgiveness. You forgave my sin. And it goes through that, you know, God became his hiding place, his protector, his deliverer, his counselor. He told him which way to go. Um, he gave, he, God gave him God's wisdom. Um, uh, he, he was surrounded by God's love. David was able to experience the presence of God at when he confessed his sin, he trusted in God's uh, forgiveness. Um, and so David was a man, I think Paul's using as an example, like he lived out this righteousness from God. So he lived by faith. He put his trust in the Lord to take away sin and to take away the punishment for sin. Um, and when God does that, he will never, ever, ever bring your sin up again. We talked about that last week. So I think Paul's saying that we trust in Christ on the on the cross. Our sins are gone, right? God imparts his righteousness on you. Remember, we talked about that accounting ledger, that we are in grave debt because of our sin. We are indebted to God because of our sin. And God wipes that out. And he, and he puts, he takes that away and then out of the one side of the ledger. And then he credits our account with Christ's righteousness. Um, so then we go back to Abraham, and just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it, but I was planning on reading it, but um, um, but it's so important in Paul's argument. So basically what he's saying in verses um, 9 to 10, he's saying, look, for all you who put your faith in your Jewishness or, uh, or think that you were saved because you're circumcised, you're wrong. Because let's look back, let's go back to Abraham. Abraham, God credited Abraham with righteousness. He declared him righteous. God saved Abraham that moment that he believed God and trusted in God, right? And then later gave Abraham the right of circumcision. So it wasn't the circumcision that saved Abraham. It was his faith. And it was God's grace through his faith in God. So, so he goes on to say that you know, it's not only Abraham, but all who believe, all who trust in Christ's righteousness um, and, and, and his pe payment for our sins on the cross, um, is, it's too available to all who believe. Um, so, and so all who believe are actually Abraham's true offspring. And of course, this righteousness is through faith. And then he goes on, verse 11, to talk about, you know, it's not the law. It can't be the law. The law can never turn God's wrath away. It's not meant to do that. The law was meant to show us why we need a turning from, uh, a turning away of God's wrath, right? Um, so it's not the method of doing that. Um, but um, and then we go on to um, to 16 and Paul says, therefore, the promise comes by faith. 
so that it may be grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are through faith, through faith, through the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Um, so it's just what we said. And it is written, I have made you father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed and God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they are. Right, so again, just reinforcing, you know, what we've been saying, that trusting in Christ's death on the cross as atonement for our sin, uh, that he paid that death penalty for us, that we would not have to experience that, that in that, the moment we believe, God's wrath is turned aside, and, um, and, and that's the moment of our salvation. So, and this is a promise, again, to all who believe, it doesn't matter. Um, so then verse 18, against all hope, Abraham in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said uh, to him. Um, so God said, so, so, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening his faith, Abraham faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a 100 years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. And yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he promised. I'm sorry, it's probably the IRS has an arrest warrant out for me or something, right? <laughs> Get those stupid calls, sorry. But that's a very important verse. I want to read it again. Abraham was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he said he was going to do. So all of God's promises are safe and secure. And that Holy Spirit is God's guarantee to us. When that Holy Spirit gets deposited into our, into our hearts, into our lives, we are sure and secure. So our salvation is so assured by God. Um, he guarantees it. It is the um, Abraham believed God and it was credited uh, to him as righteousness against all hope. Abraham was a hundred years old. Uh, Sarah was a little younger. And so Paul's saying, look, their bodies were as good as dead regarding childbearing. You know, it, it would have had to have been a, an absolute miracle for Sarah to conceive. But he hoped and not the wishy-washy, oh, I hope I have a kid. He, that hope was I'm confident I'm going to have a kid because God said so. And when God says something, it's a done deal, right? So he trusted that God's word to him, his promise to him was true and will come true. Um, and, you know, pr the problem for us is we kind of like to know, we want to know what the plan is. We want to know the details of the plan. We want to know the how, the when, the what, the where, <laughs> right? We want to know everything about it, right? But, you know, that's... You know, that's not always how God works. You know, he doesn't always tell us the whole picture. And he has a reason for that, right? Because he wants to build our faith. You know, if we, um, if we, um, if we got everything, went what we wanted, when we wanted it, uh, we wouldn't have a need for, for growing in our faith. We wouldn't have to trust God, right? But it's his grace to us that he's always putting us in situations and giving us opportunities to trust him, uh, to grow us, right? Um, and, and oftentimes that, you know, we don't have the same, we don't look at our circumstances with God's eyes always. So, you know, sometimes we think things are good for us and they're really not. Like my seven-year-old just can't figure out why, you know, she can't have cookies and ice cream and candy and soda all the time. <laughs> you know, she just, she, that's all she would eat. <laughs> In fact, my almost 19-year-old <laughs> kind of eats a lot of fast food and oh, anyway, not always good for him, you know, and maybe things that are good in life, um, that God shows us as good, but not always our best, right? So, but God knows what's best for us. He, because he is trustworthy and he is good. Um, and it says, scripture says, Abraham, he did not waver in his unbelief but he kept his hope in the lord and he walked with god and god called him his friend what a uh what a privilege right for god to call you his friend and abraham lived by faith right remember the righteous will live by faith i hope that you were able to read and if you i'm not going to read it for the sake of time but reread hebrews 11 where it talks about uh abraham because he had to trust God for a lot of things. He, he, God called him to leave, um, and he obeyed. He went. 
Um, he had to live, um, Hebrew says, as, as a stranger in a foreign land. But he, he did it because he looked forward to his heavenly home, not necessarily his earthly home, but his heavenly home, right? He believed God's promise. You know, he, he had to trust God for a lot of things. Um, he had to trust God uh, to provide for him in the desert, you know, food and, and, and water, and not just for him, but for many, many, many servants, many, many, many animals. Um, so he trusted God step by step. Um, he also had to trust God. You know, if you go back and we're going to see that in, in the future, year, in a year or two, we're going to see how God, uh, Abraham had to trust God to protect Lot. Abraham, to, he had to release, release Ishmael. Uh, he had to trust God with Ishmael. Uh, he had to trust God, of course, to have a son born to him. Um, and then God called him to sacrifice that son. And Hebrews explains it. Like Abraham, God told Abraham that the promise that all nations would be blessed through you would be through Isaac, the, the son of the promise, right? And um, so Abraham, when God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, that must have not made sense to him, right? Because he waited all those years. I mean, I really think, I, I, if memory serves me correctly, I think he waited about 25 years from the time God first promised Isaac to be born to the time that he was born. So that's a long time to wait, 25 years. You know, we can't even wait. We don't even wait 25 months for something, let alone 25 years. You know, it's amazing. Uh, what faith. But, um, you know, but, you know, and then, and then Hebrews, I love that in Hebrews, it goes on to say, you know, Abraham and the other, uh, other people of faith, they did not necessarily see all that God promised them in this lifetime, right? Um, I really believe that Abraham had a sense that that all nations being blessed would be something along the lines of God sending a savior, God sending a Messiah. Um, it's probably very fuzzy for him, um, but I think he had that sense that God wanted to do some great work of salvation to call people to him and that it would come through him, through Isaac through his son Isaac, you know, but, but, you know, Abraham didn't know the name Jesus, but he still believed God, that God would accomplish his purposes uh, in his way, in his timing. And again, he didn't see that while he walked the earth, but uh, Abraham does see it now. Uh, in fact, when Jesus in uh, John 8 was bantering with the, um, the Pharisees, Pharisees were giving him a hard time and he was really trying to correct them and rebuke them. Um, he said to them that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. So um, in Romans 4, you know, we too who live by faith, you know, we know that we will see all of God's promises become true, uh, if not in this life, of course, in the life to come. Well, what do you struggle with? Do you, are you experiencing a death of a dream, death of a loved one, death of a relationship, death of a career? Maybe your reputation's been murdered. Um, God, can, God brings life out of death. Abraham was 100% absolutely convinced that God had the power uh, to do what he's promised God, I, I look at this world now and I go, oh my goodness, I fear. I fear for our children. I really do. Our children, our grandchildren. And yet God can make love come out of even the most hateful situations. God can bring peace out of the most chaotic situations. He can bring joy out of the most miserable situations, right? He, he, he makes a way when there doesn't seem to be a way. In God, in ho ho he brings hope when all hope seems lost, right? He's the God of miracles. He, he does miracles for those who trust him. Um, one of our favorite sayings, Jeff and I, why we live in New England, <laughs> well, the light shines brighter in the darkness, right? We, we, we know that um, when things seem their grimmest, um, God can bring life. He can bring revival. He can bring renewal. Uh, and he does it in his way, in his timing. When all hope seems lost, when all circumstances say otherwise, right? Abraham chose to put his faith in God and walk with God because he knew that God was the God of the impossible. He knew God had the power to do the impossible, right? 
When we were dead in our sins, Christ made us alive in, in, in him. And that was last week. <laughs> you saw that. With God, all things are possible. Um, but, you know, and at that moment, we begin our faith journey with God, right? And God's desire, he wants to grow you in, in your faith. And he wants to give you every opportunity to do that. He will take every opportunity in life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to grow your faith. Right? As we trust him in all our circumstances and we walk with him, right? We grow. We grow in our faith. We grow in our knowledge of who God is, our experience of who God is. Um, and, and, um, and, and we walk in those works that God has preordained for us uh, for his kingdom and all for his glory. And he gets glory for all of that. Um, and, and so, and it is, and, and I know you, you would know that from experience. It's often the, the toughest stuff of life is when God, uh, really, um, you know, we, we feel the closest to God. We grow the closest to God. He really grows our faith the most, right? So it will be, and often it is, uh, again, and it is our brokenness. It is through our brokenness often, uh, our broken health, our broken relationships, our broken bank accounts, our broken, um, backs, <laughs> um, where God, you know, you really feel God belaying you to him, right? With his power, right? Um, you know, it's not, it's not, it, I think we need to look at our brokenness uh, as a gift because, um, because it's through our brokenness we realize that we can't do it. We can't do it in our own strength. And it's got to be the work of the Holy Spirit uh, to, 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 to do it through us. Um, it's our brokenness uh, where God often enables us to climb to greater heights of faith, right? He challenges us to elevate um, our, 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 take our uh, relationship with him up a notch often. And that's when he receives um, more, the more glory. Often it is through our brokenness and us maneuvering through the broken pieces of our life is often where um, God gets the most glory in our lives, um, not our strength. Um, so, you know, we don't like to think that way. We think that we maybe if we're doing it in our strength, we're stronger for God. But really, in reality, uh, because of our sinful nature, nature, you know, we kind of take the glory a lot of times when we um, work according to our strength or we work in our wholeness. And so that's why... Uh, oftentimes, I believe, uh, God gets uh, the most mileage, and he gets the most glory, uh, we grow the most um, during those really tough, tough situations in life. Um, don't doubt God for a second. He has the ability to heal the brokenness in life. You bring your broken pieces to God. He can put them back together uh, greater ways and, and a greater ability and a greater and, and, and see a greater finished product than you could ever uh, hope to accomplish, right? In and of ourselves, right? Um, he promises to heal us uh, it, and he does it in his ways, uh, with, in his timing. And sometimes we see him, we see him uh, heal us physically, heal relationships, uh, heal, you know, the brokenness on our jobs. Sometimes we see him uh, do that right away uh, and we give him glory for that and he is glorified and he is honored and he's worthy to receive glory for that. Um, and other times that doesn't happen that quickly and we gotta dig down in our faith and really you know, struggle uh, through our circumstances and it's those times that we really cling to God and we're on our knees and we really, and we see, we feel his power. Uh, we feel his strength. Um, we, 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 um, lean on his wisdom and he gives us his wisdom and he shows us which way to go. Um, and it, so it's, and, and, and sometimes, um, our life's broken pieces won't ever be healed until we get to heaven. And that's okay. Cause that's what it's up to him. It's up to him when to do it. Um, it's up to him to decide how to heal us and when, um, you know, it's up to him and we can trust him to know what's best for us and what is going to actually maximize the amount of glory that he gets through us. Remember, it's about treasures in heaven. It's not about the stuff of earth. So we need to see that God is gonna take advantage of every circumstance in my life to bring about what's best for me and to maximize the glory that God receives in heaven. 
And, you know, so what is God's goal for our lives is for us to fix our eyes on Jesus, to run the race that God's marked out for us, to win the prize, right, that he's called us heavenly. He calls us to elevate our thinking, to elevate our values, to, to and, and put our goals uh, set for uh, for the, the for the values and the goals of the kingdom, right? We need to set our hearts to follow Jesus and make his kingdom a priority, right? In our hearts and how we think and how we um, um, organize our time and what we value in life. You know, we want to align those uh, with Jesus, with 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 his kingdom, right? Because Jesus said it's about building treasures in heaven, not about the stuff of earth. So God, he wants us to, to see that, that both David and, and Abraham trusted and obeyed God and they lived by faith and they trusted in God's promises that were true and they knew would come true. Um, maybe they didn't see it when they lived, but they knew, they, they, they knew um, as they walked with God, they experienced the presence of God, uh, they experienced his love and his forgiveness in their lives, they saw God. Uh, God re revealed himself to them. They, they experienced his goodness, his, his, um, his faithfulness, uh, his trueness, you know, that he can't lie, uh, that he will make good on his promises. Um, and they walked by faith and they gave glory to God. And when we do that, just like David, just like Abraham, we too, we will experience that Jesus is our rock. We will experience that he's our fortress. He's our deliverer. He's our defender. He's our protector. He's our provider, right? He is worthy of us putting our hope in because he is the hope, right? We can trust him. Even when my circumstances don't make sense, even when God's word tells me to do one thing, but my circumstances say to do something else and the world's telling me to do something else, I put my confidence in what God says because I know what he says He's going to work it out for my best when I follow him, when I obey him. So God is calling us to walk with confidence, walk with a surety that your salvation is sure and secure because it's all done by him and it's held by his power. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the Holy Spirit within us as a deposit guaranteeing us. That's why we can have confidence to know that he holds our salvation by his keeping power what he starts, he promises he will finish. He will see us there. And it's and, and he will act for in all your circumstances, the good in life, the bad in life, and the ugly in life, right? As we are surrendering to him and we are submitting to him, he will work all things for our good, for our best, according to what God says is our best, and to receive so that God receives the most glory through us, treasures in heaven, right? We will grow in our faith. We will grow in our experience of God. We will grow in our desire to be made more like Jesus. We will be able to know God's will, right? We will be able to have the power to do God's will, right? As we, as we come to him. So salvation by grace, works follow. A very pretty, pretty hefty rest of Romans is going to be, okay, now that I'm in Christ, how shall I then live? So that's a lot of it is going to be about that transformation process, right? Um, the word, trust in the words of Jesus when he said, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced, right? We too will see all of God's promises come true, either in this lifetime or in the next one, but it will happen. And my PS to you is, Bring something to dinner because, not because you feel obligated to, but because you love and appreciate being chosen. Amen.